Hello everybody and welcome to another FaceTime Live here at the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery. My name is Kate Morris and I work here at the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery. And before we commence, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the First Nations people, the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, as the traditional and original owners and continuing custodians of this land on which we are on today. And acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. So thank you. So today I'm here with Dr. Kiralee Moore. Um, hello, Kiralee. Hi, Kate. Good to see you. Yes. Um, and Kiralee is going to introduce us to um, some aspects of the invertebrate collection over here at Rosny, which is where our collection facility is for the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery. So, Kiralee, can you tell me a little bit about your role here at the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery? Certainly. Um, I am the collection manager for the invertebrate collection. So, the invertebrate. The invertebrate collection has animals that don't have backbones. So we range from sponges and sea stars and spiders and um, scorpions, um, all across a whole range of animals, big and small. Um, and I, my job mainly is to look after the collection itself. So I label, register, database, um, rearrange, um, uh, accept new donations, identify specimens. Um, it's a fascinating job and it changes all the time. Yeah, it, it, sounds, it sounds quite like a big, big job, a large job, mm. you know, and quite diverse, really. You, you said just now, you said sea stars. I was just curious about that terminology. Is there a, another word that some people are more familiar with? Yes, well, uh, traditionally we call them sea starfish, but um, they're not a fish. So we're trying to encourage people to not use the word fish in, a, in a, an attempt to make our common names more accurate. So a sea star oh. is, a, is a good way of getting around that. Um, another one is a cuttlefish. So you can call them cuddle bones or cuddles. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, wh so where are we exactly? Well, here we are in our natural history collection store, our large one. So we have um, behind us here, we have, or oh, in oh, front of me, there's a door. <laughs> and inside there is a large um, vertebrate store. So that's where our mounts and our study skins are. And that's where you'll find the big... Um, antler heads and um, you know six spectacular uh, yeah. birds from England. Yes, all sorts of things like that. Um, over in this direction, we have um, our insect collection. You can see them in insect cabinets. They go down and, and down that way a bit. And then further down, we have our mollusk collection in our dry mollusk cabinets. And then we have other things we store dry, like some dry crustaceans and echinoderms, which are sea stars and urchins and other things, and then some corals. And then right down the bottom, we have the osteology collection, which is the bones collection from the vertebrates. Mm -hmm. And in the middle, so, in oh, the middle yeah. we have the geology collection, geology, minerals, rocks, minerals, and um, fossils down the middle. Gosh, quite a diverse collection in here then. Yeah. yeah. I think you're going to talk to us particularly about something today, yes. which we can find somewhere else. So That's right. So you lead the way. Down here. Gosh, so these are all full of shelving and specimens. And as you said, this is the geology collection. Yes, yeah. this is our compactus. Mm. Most yeah. people are used to compactus. They're a very efficient storage method mm. where the shelves move. And so you can uh, stack them up tightly and make as much use as you can. Mm. We also have um, a substantial cetacean collection. So cetacean is the word for whales and dolphins. Um, Often they're so big we can't keep the whole skeleton, so we tend to keep just the skulls. Um, and so they mm. are useful for diagnostic features and uh, taxonomic features and records of strandings. There's a very particular smell in here, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, it's, I've um, stopped noticing it. You now. probably have. No, for, for visitors like myself, it's, it's quite curious. It's sort of a mixture of sort of chemicals and things. It, I quite like it, actually. Yeah, mm. it's a, it's, um, yeah, it makes you think you're somewhere different. Yeah. So where are we now? So here is our, the door to our wet collection. So in okay. here we store things that need to be kept wet. Um, we, that's things like mainly soft-bodied animals um, and the vertebrates, things that need to be inside, that we preserve the insides, um, mm -hmm. and also things like um, anemones and um, shells with their, with their animals still inside them. and. Um, spiders and a whole variety of things. Um, it's all, most of it is stored in ethanol, which is highly flammable. 
um, and evaporates out quite quickly. So we're not allowed to take any electronic device in there, which includes the camera we're using. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll, we, uh, we can look in. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> because the ethanol is so for, um, flammable, we have um, abundant floor, which means the flood, we can't flood out. We have specific ventilation that keeps the fumes down. We have specific lighting that uh, won't spark and create um, a, an explosion. Um, and um, we have a few other things that uh, are specific to this collection, which makes it a wonderful, it's a fantastic facility, and we're really lucky to have it. It stores at least 25,000 litres of ethanol in there. Ooh. Um, you can see most of them are stored in glass jars on shelves. Mm, mm. And, um, and then we also have some big tubs, uh, which store our big animals, and a, a lot of drums, which store uh, larger things as well. Okay. So as we can't go in today, I know you've been very organised and have brought Something some things I out earlier. Yeah, yeah. And this is um, your your speciality. Your, yes. Yeah. So my um, I did my PhD a few years ago on deep sea corals, and I, I know a lot of people don't realise that we have deep sea corals. Deep sea corals are things that um, don't have the zooxanthellate algae that you have corals that we associate with the Great Barrier Reef build build a reef mm -hmm. um, but these because it's dark they're down below 200 meters um, and down to at least as deep as four and a half thousand meters um, they it's dark the algae can't grow there so they're just animals that live on the seafloor and they feed they look like a bush or a tree so it's more like a coral garden than a coral reef yes um, and they are a huge variety and we have quite a lot, particularly on the Tasmanian seamounts, south of Tasmania. Um, and we have a great association with CSIRO and the Australian Antarctic Division, which are just down the road from us. And they have um, collections that come from their voyages and their studies. And we um, accept them, store them here, and, um, and, they can, and everyone can access them. So have you ever been on one of those, um, those surveys or, or investigations? I'm not quite sure what the term is for those yes, voyages. Um, we used to call yeah. them cruises, but that sounded too <laughs> <laughs> easy. No, voyages. It's, voyages, yes. okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I have. I've been lucky enough to be on, oh, I don't know, three or four now. Oh, really? Um, one of them went south through Antarctica, which was fabulous. And I've done some seamount ones and I've done um, uh, the abyssal voyage, which is a few years ago now, which we were looking at things that grow in the abyss. Um, but yes, on one of those voyages, um, I was really lucky to collect, um, well, I didn't collect this one, but I was part of the, um, the group that was looking at this specimen. And we looked at, uh, for my PhD, I looked at a number of different specimens from around the world and all the literature that was involved. And um, we decided that this one was undescribed. It was a species that we didn't know about. In the water, it's a beautiful, deep, magenta purple colour and it looks spectacular and it stands up um, with branches up like this and um, and so we I knew I could figure out it was in the genus Victorgorgia but I was able to give it the name which I chose eminens which is Latin for eminence or prominent or obvious because in the video footage of those sea floors, you could spot these giant purple corals really easily. So how big are they, Kiralee? Uh, uh, the biggest one I've seen is about that big. Okay, yeah. okay. So you, could you have named it after yourself if you felt like it? Well, <laughs> technically <laughs> yes, but it's not done. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> frowned upon. Um, but, uh, but you can have quite a lot of fun with the naming. You can yeah, some, yeah. Um, do some really um, innovative names and it's quite a fun thing. That's part of the uh, joy of it. Oh, and the, yeah, red, so, the hmm. red tape and the red dot is an indication that it's the holotype. And the holotype means it's the specimen that that name, that scientific Latin name, will always be associated with that specimen. Um, and that's why it's stored at the museum and it will be f for in perpetuity and anyone can use it and borrow it and check whether they've got that specimen, that species against this particular specimen. So very important then. Very important. Yeah. These are our yeah. most important specimens. This one is... Um, Primnoisis tasmani, and it's uh, another one that I described. So tasmani was the name because it was found from the Tasmanian seamounts, and also my son is named Tasman. And so um, this one is a blue dot, which means it's a paratype. So it's, the holotype is here as well, but the, 
paratypes are a sort of a backup to the holotype and they also give a range of the variation within the species. That's interesting. So did that one have colour before it was um, put into ethanol? Oh, only slightly. Okay. Yes, ethanol will suck colour out of almost everything except some. So there are ones <laughs> like this yeah. where the, the colour is embedded in the um, calcium carbonate um, tiny minuscule structures that are on the outside of this. Um, it's called paragorgia. Um, it, it's in, it, the colour is embedded in the calcium carbonate and so the, it doesn't leach out. But almost right. everything else will. So I was going to say that's quite unusual, is it? Perhaps that's the coral specimens. Yeah. yeah. So how long does it take? Sorry to be, <laughs> but how long does it take for the colour to actually go? Oh, it can it? be days. Oh, very quite quickly. quickly. Yeah. Mm. So photographs are really yes. important, and also most of our coral specimens we get from uh, a trawl. So often they're in pieces when we get them. So we trying to use the video footage to reconstruct the sh how they looked when mm. they were alive, mm. but also the colour is important as well. Got to ask you about, yes, <laughs> yes I so think that's where you were going. I know, this, yeah. this one, people will say, that's not a coral. And it depends, coral is a strange word that is um, a bit flexible, but it is very closely related to these ones. These are oh. soft corals, so Alcyonia, and this is part of the Alcyonia. So it's a, um, um, sorry, it's part of the Octocoral Aya, which, and, and this is a Penatulacea. Mm. So it's a sea pen, and the sea pens, uh, very closely related to these and they are embedded usually in the soft sediment. So they, uh, you'll see them out in the deep abyssal plains. There'll be um, just nothing else and the, that you can see and, um, and mud and then there'll be one of these, that's upside down. Um, oh. That'll be sticking in the mud and these oh, folds are um, how it feeds. So they'll be flowing in the, in the water current. Must be rather pretty. Yes, they are yeah. quite beautiful and they're quite diverse as well. You, sometimes you'll see them washed up on a beach and people go, what is that? Oh, well, that's most of them are deep, deep yeah. water. This one is a yes. black coral. So black corals are one of those corals that we've had over the years. Um, it used to be used for jewellery, but now they're all protected. They only occur in deep water. The shallowest one I've heard of is 60 metres off the coast of Bishno. Um, but this one is from a, a trawl and it's deep and they're tiny, tiny polyps. They're really small. So the polyps are the things that they feed with. So the little white dots in here are polyps. And these ones have tiny polyps and they're, they're being studied right now at JCU, um, doing a whole, a whole phylogeny of these in, from Australia. So are all coral specimens kept in ethanol like this? No, so th thankfully some of them um, can be stored dry. It doesn't affect them um, too much. So if you follow me, I'll Ooh. show you some dry ones. Oh, excellent. Ooh, gosh, they're spectacular, aren't they? Yeah. So you can see sometimes it's actually just incredibly difficult to find a container to put them in. <laughs> Um, they're very, very fragile. Um, so this one is a, uh, a specimen of the same genus as the one we saw around there that had the orange colour. Um, we think this mm. one is undescribed. We think this is a spe species that nobody has um, actually given a name to yet. Uh, so this, this specimen would probably become the holotype if anybody did. Um, and it's just safest here. which And drying it out doesn't affect its... Um, structure or um, or its DNA or anything like that so we it's a perfectly safe way to do it there are other ones which I won't pick that one up because it's so fragile but this one is another example of a black coral um, and you can see the tiny very thin filaments at the ends and on those are the tiny tiny polyps so that you can see that's how they would have made jewelry from yes that sort of hard it's very hard shiny structure so Kiralee, corals must be incredibly important in the environment and can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, you can see how they literally grow up into the water column. So they become, um, part of it is so that they can feed themselves in the current, but they also make their own currents by affecting the water flow around them. And, um, and so they become an incredibly important habitat for things to live on them and in them and around them. So often there are sea stars and brittle stars attached to the specimens themselves um, and they feed up in the water column um, and also they uh, create an, a, a, um, an abundance of food for fish mm. for example to come and feed on the things that are feed, living on the corals. 
They're also incredibly long lived. Some of them um, are hundreds of years old. We, we can age them sometimes. They like a tree um, and lay down rings, um, but we don't exactly know what, the ring, what a ring means. Does it mean a year? Mm. Does it, seasons don't really matter down deep. The, cha- the temperatures don't change. So some grow fast, some grow slow. So we um, are using a different variety of ways of aging them. So I can imagine if there was damage made to coral, then it probably takes a very, we probably don't know perhaps how long it takes to recover or if it can recover. Yes, well, one of the voyages I was on was just down south to Tasmanian seamounts and we were looking at them at the 30 year mark since the, 20 year mark since the, since the um, coral, since the fishery was closed, the orange fishery was closed and, um, and there's not a lot of evidence yet of regrowth. Is that the orange roughy fishery you're yeah. mentioning? Yeah. Okay. yeah, so the orange roughy fishery tend to, orange roughy tend to live near the seafloor so the, the um, trawls that they were using were close to the bottom and would pick up the corals. In fact, this one was donated to us from a, um, a fisherman who'd been on a vessel in, the, in that era um, and he'd taken it home and put it on his mantelpiece for a few years. But now, thankfully, he's donated it to us, which is the great. Collection does. It's Huge. one of our big ones to show that those particular species can get very, very tall. Mm. Mm. Um, I've, seen, I've seen ones that are, you know, a full tree size. It's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, th- that, that um, damage done to the trawls, by the trawls in those particular places in the seamounts, we're monitoring them and seeing how long it takes for them to show some regrowth. Yes, mm. so lots of work to be done. Yeah. So Kiralee, we're just going to head back to where we were before and um, we're just going to talk about something else that you've been involved in recently. Yes, yes, we need to... So I thought we might come back here, or you thought we might come back here, and come back to um, this display of um, whales and dolphins and tell us a little bit about the whale stranding that happened on the west coast of Tasmania. What was that, about six weeks ago now? Gosh, I <laughs> yes, no, it, it wasn't that long ago, but it was a, a huge stranding, mm. and you had to race off with other members of the TMAG team to, to go and to see what was going on. So can you tell us a little bit more about that experience? Yes, mm. so um, TMAG, is a, our zoology team, is a small team, so um, our, our vertebrate zoology collection manager needed some help. So I went with her, and we headed off over there because TMAG um, is really important and holding evidence of um, strandings. We keep tissue samples and um, um, uh, potentially skulls and parts of the animals that are stranded as a permanent record of what happened at a stranding and um, of the animals that were stranded. So while we were there, we were mainly concentrating on the animals that had already died. Um, Most of the live ones were out on a sandbank that um, was about a metre deep and so they um, needed to be um, moved from that sandbank out to deeper water where the boat could pick them up and take them out the heads. But we were mainly working on the large ocean beach that's there where whales had washed up um, and died there. Mm. And we would take, for about 50 whales, we took uh, measurements, um, blubber, skin, muscle tissue, um, and um, tested if they were lactating, sexed them, um, and um, but we we were running out of time. They deteriorate quickly, and so we needed to be um, a little bit more urgent. So we there was another whole pod of whales a bit further away on a di- different beach that had died um, on the beach. So we could access those, and we just took tissue samples for those and measurements and tested if they were lactating. So the idea was, and the, there were 200 there, so we got 250 samples in the end. Right, how many, how many were there all together in this pod? They think it was about 450. It's really? very difficult to tell because no. some came back and some went out and mm. some got, got themselves mm. out. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, about 450, which is the largest that we've had in Tasmania and um, I'm not that sure about of, Australia. Yes. Yeah, that we know of, yeah. yes, that we've yeah. recorded. Mm. So some people were involved in trying to refloat the animals, yes. and whereas you were on a very different task. And these, these tissue specimens that you take... Are they sort of quite big, quite small? What happens to them then? Yes, we'd only take a, a small piece of skin, maybe about that big, um, and we put them in a, 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 a little vial and then we put them in what is uh, our minus 80 freezers. So the minus 80 is designed to be able to stabilise everything. Um, 
uh, they're at such a low temperature that they you, you can stop any sort of um, de mm. degradation. And then we store those specimens and we've had a huge number of requests from people already all around the world to try and access these samples uh, to answer a whole variety of questions about whales and strandings and the structures of whale uh, populations. And, um, and so we assess their requests, their, um, the, the research they're attempting to do, and then we will, we will send those specimens out to them. Um, sometimes the specimens get used up, There's not, and, we, and we won't have them anymore, but sometimes uh, we, we will always keep some from mm. some of those whales. But, um, but yeah, we try and cut them up into small bits mm. and, and get to as many people as possible. It must have been quite a challenging few days for you there. It's not something I really envy you. I mean, it was quite cold, I think, was it? And, and obviously wet. Yes. Um, and traumatic, I would have thought, seeing that many animals in yes. distress. Yeah. Yes, yes. And there was nothing you could do. So mm. one of the, some of the times we saw a few that had not quite died and we were trying to assess whether they um, needed to be euthanized or could be saved. Um, and they was, that was sad because there were just two or three of us and we couldn't possibly help. You can't even keep them wet. You've got another job to do. Mm. Um, so that was hard. Um, and also they're, they're just, um, yeah, they, they get smelly and they yes. start to bloat and um, yeah, yes, so it was, a decomposing and it, yeah, it was quite cold and wet. Yes. So yeah, yeah. it was yeah. very impressive though that the, uh, the fish farms helped a huge amount and they were loading the dead ones mm. into a sea pen and taking them out to sea mm. to take them out of the harbour and that was really impressive. Right. Quite an experience by the sounds of it things. Was. And I think as you said at the very beginning of when we talked how diverse your job can be and, and that's yet something else that you can sometimes be involved that's in. That's right. This is obviously an exceptional situation. We, we mm. heard about it on a Monday lunchtime. I remember saying mm. to Belinda, um, oh there's a whale stranding. I just heard it on the radio and we left the next morning with yes. all our gear and we were gone for four days you so weren't. you do have yeah. to just suddenly get up and go, go and yeah. adapt and and the um de Pipwi, our our local um primary industries department env environment mm. department uh coordinated them. it was amazing fantastic mm. job mm. yeah really hugely difficult logistics and um was really great yeah. Well, we've run out of time and it's been absolutely fascinating to hear about all your experiences and to know what goes on in these stores and particularly about corals, which I think a lot of people maybe don't think about corals first up um, when they think of museum collecting and collections and how those corals get here and what they can tell us. And again, about the whale strandings and the important work that museums are involved in, um, in collecting that data, um, data and, um, and, 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 sharing that with other institutions so that we can all learn about you know what's going on so thank you ever so much Ooh, um, i you. really enjoyed hearing about everything um, and uh, i look forward to talking to you again sometime about more things so thank you very much Kiralee. Um i'd also like to thank the friends of the tasmania museum and art gallery for supporting these facebook live uh, programs that we do on the first wednesday of the month thank you to veronica for filming today and hopefully we'll see you again in another month's time for another Facebook live session. Thanks.